Welcome to worship at Walnut Grove Lutheran Church, and uh, we are so thankful for the technology that God has given us that enables us to worship together as a faith community in spite of the challenging times that we find ourselves in. And uh, so it's a great and wonderful thing that we can do this, and I'm so glad that all of you are here today in person, and I also welcome all of you that are watching online. In our worship service today, we are continuing our Love and Serve series, and we're thinking about what it means to love others with servant hearts. And so I invite you to stand if you are able, and let's begin our time of worship together today in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. As we enter into our time of worshiping our good and gracious God together, Let's do so with clean hearts and minds by admitting our brokenness and receiving God's free and full forgiveness. I invite you to join with me in praying a prayer of confession. Gracious and loving God, because of our flawed and broken nature, we often fail to keep the royal law of love first and foremost in our lives. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. And we have failed to serve others as you have directed us. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Hear these words of assurance from God. God the Father sent his son Jesus Christ to take away all of your guilt and shame. Jesus died on the cross and rose again to give you a new life with him that will last forever. Because of what Jesus has done for you, I can assure you that you are completely forgiven by God. You are a beloved child of God who has been empowered by the Holy Spirit to love God, love people, and serve the world. Rest in the peace and the joy of your salvation. Amen. You may be seated. Forever 
breath Till that stone was moved for good For the Lamb had conquered death And the dead rose from their tombs And the angels stood in awe For the souls of all who'd come To the Father are restored And the Church of Christ was born Then the Spirit lit the flame Now this gospel truth of old Shall not kneel, shall not faint By His blood and in His name In His freedom I am free For the love of Jesus Christ Who has resurrected me During the six weeks of our Love and Serve series, we are uh, lifting up and thanking God for all the many, many volunteers who help make the ministry that we do together possible. And uh, today we're thanking God for just some of the people who help out with worship. So please uh, bow with me in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we, we thank you for each and every person that you have uh, moved by your love uh, to serve others. And today we especially give you thanks for those uh, who serve in our worship ministry. We pray uh, a thanksgiving for Carolyn and the, the wonderful children's messages that she blesses us with. We thank you, Lord, for our readers, Michelle G., Tony, Jane, Owen, David, Dave, Katrina, Angie, Hoon, Julie, Ben, Nathan, Denise, Ron, Barry, Lisa O., and Mitchell. We thank you, Lord, for our online hosts and for the way that they uh, bless people especially those who are new to online worship. Bless, we pray, Julie K., Mateo, Denise, Jillian, Duncan, and Chris K. And we thank you, Lord, for all those who helped with drive-in communion when we were doing uh, uh, things in that way. Thank you, Lord, for Lisa D., Jeremy, Reese, Kurt, Jerry, Carolyn, Kathleen, Michelle P., Tim, Wayne, Laura, and Rhonda. And Lord, we ask that you not only uh, bless each and every one of these people, but that as uh, they serve, um, they would not only bless others, but uh, you, they would be drawn to, closer to you in their serving. And we thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. From John chapter 13, verses 1 to 17. Before the Passover celebration, Jesus knew that the hour had come to leave this world and return to his Father. He had loved his disciples during his ministry on earth, and now he loved them to the very end. It was time for supper, and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had given him authority over everything that he had to come from God and would return to God. 
So he got up from the table and took off his robe, wrapped a towel around his waist, poured water, and poured water into a basin. Then he began to wash the disciples' feet, drying them with the towel he had around him. When Jesus came to Simon Peter, Peter said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you don't understand now what, am I, what I am doing, but someday you will. No, Peter protested, you will never ever wash my feet. Jesus replied, unless I wash you, you won't belong to me. Simon Peter exclaimed, then wash my hands and my head as well, Lord, not just my feet. Jesus replied, a person who bathed all over does not need to wash except for the feet to be entirely clean. And you disciples are clean, but not all of you. For Jesus knew who would betray him. That is what he meant when he said, not all of you are clean. After washing their feet, he put on his robe again and sat down and asked, do you understand what I was doing? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, because that's what I am. And since I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you ought to wash each other's feet. I have given you an example to follow. Do as I have done to you. I tell you the truth. Slaves are not greater than their master, nor is the messenger more important than the one who sends the message. Now that you know these things, God will bless you for doing them. It's pretty exciting for me to be here doing my children's lesson here at church. I'm not quite where I like to be down on the stairs with kids around, but it's coming, and it's something that I'm looking forward to. Today is also the very first day of summer, and that's something I'm looking forward to. The weather didn't really cooperate with what I would like it to be, but we're looking forward to really sunny, fun days. And one thing that I look forward to is putting on my flip-flops because it means it's warm out, I can run around, well, walk quickly, have fun out in the yard, maybe the beach. But you know what the downside of flip-flops is? Your feet get really dirty. I don't know if you guys have noticed that. At our house, we all had to wash our feet before bed. And thinking of feet washing, we read about that just now, didn't we? So I was thinking, and I might have asked you this before, but let's just say you were out for a day in your flip-flops and you came home and your mom said, oh, we have a very special guest for dinner tonight. It's the CEO of my company, a very important man. Let's call him Mr. Boss. So you come in and Mr. Boss sees your dirty feet and says, hey, hang on a second. Let me wash those feet for you. You can't imagine that happening. Or what if you're on holidays with your family? Maybe Ottawa, you know? And you're walking around the parliament buildings, your whole family, and who do you see? You see the, the prime minister. Justin Trudeau is there. And he stops your family and he says, welcome to my city. You guys all have really dirty feet. Here, let me get a basin and wash your feet and make them all nice and clean. Can you imagine that happening? So why is it when we hear the story of Jesus washing feet, it seems kind of normal for us, and we accept that as normal, and yet Jesus, the Son of God, washed people's feet? I think it's because Jesus set such a good example, and that's who he was. And can you imagine if we followed like Jesus and also served people and treated them so well? What a different world we'd live in. We hear a lot of bad news in the world, and I think sometimes if we all treated each other like Jesus treated people, our world would be an amazing place. Let's have a prayer. Dear God, help us to treat others well. You sent us Jesus, who died on the cross and rose again, and he washed people's feet. Help us go out there into the world and serve others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, everyone. Enjoy your summer. Live stream of this service, and you have a prayer request that you would like to have included in today's worship service. You can actually do it if you're here in person as well. 
And you, uh, what you can do is text your prayer request to 604-901-5322 before the end of the sermon, and then your prayer request will be included in our prayers. We're praying together today. And if you would like to follow along with uh, today's message, you can find sermon notes on our church app. Let's pray. Gracious and loving Lord, what an amazing thing it is that you speak to us through your word. We pray, dear Lord, that in the quietness of these moments, as we reflect on your word, you would speak to us once again by your spirit. We pray, dear Lord, that you would plant your words deep in our hearts and help us to live by them. Because after all, you have the words of eternal life. In the precious and holy name of Jesus, we ask this. Amen. So my favorite Marvel character, and this has been the case ever since I was little, has been uh, Spider-Man. And uh, so I was overjoyed when in 2002, uh, there was a new series of Spider-Man movies released. Maybe some of you remember that. It was the the actor playing uh, Spider-Man was Tobey Maguire and uh, did a fantastic job. And then I thought that things got even better in 2016 when Tom Holland came out as Spider-Man in Captain America Civil War and then followed it up with two solo uh, Spider-Man movies in 2017 and 2019. And I'm looking forward to uh, Spider-Man No Way Home, which is coming out later this year. Uh, But we don't talk too much about the Andrew Garfield years at our house. Now, regardless of who is playing Spider-Man, what always happens in every movie when there's a new actor uh, playing the character is there is a scene where Spider-Man is learning how to use his newfound powers after he got bit by a... Audience participation time? After he got bit by a spider. Right. And so he's... He always starts off stumbling and bumbling around, and he's making lots of hilarious mistakes along the way, but eventually he figures it out, and he's like flying through the air with the greatest of ease, a daring young man on his web-spun trapeze. You and I are like Spider-Man. Now, you may may remember the theme. Again, this is another audience participation moment. The theme that runs through all the Spider-Man movies is with great power comes great responsibility, yes. And in the movies, Spider-Man struggles to take on the great responsibility that comes with his newfound powers. Does he use his strength, his spidey senses, and his web-slinging powers to boost his own ego? Or to help others? And if he chooses to help others, how does he do it in a way that actually helps them and doesn't hurt them? And the great responsibility given to Spider-Man needs to be guided by great love. Love for his friends. Love for his fellow human beings. Just like Spider-Man, you and I struggle with these two wonderful but often misused characteristics of life, power and love. God has given all of us the power to make choices, the power to help or hurt other people. God has given all of us the ability to love. The question is, how will we use our power and love. Will we use those things for our own benefit or to help others? And if we're going to use our power and love to help others, how do we do it in such a way that actually helps them and doesn't hurt them? To help us as we think about that question, we're going to be looking at John chapter 13 verses 1 to 17 in the Bible. So if you have a Bible or a Bible app, I invite you to turn there now. 
And this is the fourth sermon in our series called Love and Serve, where we're preparing ourselves for the opportunities God is going to give us this summer to share his love with others. And we're doing that by trying to, with God's help, focus on the main thing that he's given us to do, which is to love God, love people, and serve the world. So as we look at this passage, it's important for you to know that it takes place on a Thursday night about 2,000 years ago. But this was a Thursday night unlike any other. This was the night when Jesus was betrayed by one of his followers into the hands of those who wanted to kill him. Within hours, Jesus would be arrested, beaten, and unjustly convicted of a crime he didn't commit. And then he would be flogged, stripped naked, and nailed to a cross to suffer and die a horrible death. As John tells us in his account of this special night, before the Passover celebration, Jesus knew that his hour had come to leave this world and return to his father. Because this time with his followers was so short and so precious, Jesus made sure that the things that he said and did were the most important things. And this was also the night when Jesus and his followers celebrated the Passover meal, that very special annual celebration of remembering the great moment in human history in the past when God reached down into this world and saved his people from slavery and genocide in Egypt. He brought them into the land of freedom and abundance that he had promised to give to them. So just before that very special meal that was about to begin, Jesus did something which no one else present that night would have predicted. You see, Jesus was the guest of honor. So protocol dictated that everyone else was there to serve him. But Jesus revealed that God's priorities and values are not the same as ours. And so he took off his robe, wrapped a towel around his waist, and began to wash his followers' feet. This was a dirty, stinky job because, as Carolyn noted, people wore sandals all day and walked over dusty ground. Guests would have had at least a day's worth of sweat and grime on their feet. And in that culture, people ate at banquets by uh, reclining on their left side and having their feet sticking out to the right. And that means that those dirty, stinky feet would have ended up behind your neighbor. And so they had to be washed. And this was a job that was reserved for the least important servant in the entire household. And yet here was Jesus, the most important person in the room, and the most important person in the whole wide world, doing the task that everyone else felt was beneath them. And so why would Jesus humble himself and take the position of the lowest servant in a household, and then serve those who followed him by doing what needed to be done, even though it was a disgusting and demeaning task. John's account of this night gives us some clues. First, John tells us that he, that is Jesus, had loved his disciples during his ministry on earth, and now he loved them to the very end. Now, in your Bible or Bible app, you may see a note that says, or he showed them the full extent of his love. And the reason that note is there is there's there's a a Greek word that's being translated, and it has kind of a, a nuance that we need to be aware of. The Greek word is telos, and it has this sense of fulfillment or completion which are related words, but they're not quite the same. 
But what we can say based on this word is that in the very brief moments that he had with his followers that night, Jesus loved them in such a way that they would be catapulted into a new life which results in them experiencing healing, wholeness, and the fullness of God's love. Jesus was going to love his followers right into completion. And this is what great love does. It willingly takes the lower place so that others can be lifted up to the fullness and completion that God wants to give to them. Just like on a teeter-totter, lifting others up requires that we bring ourselves down. Jesus, God the Son, modeled that for us, first in coming down from heaven to wrap himself in human flesh to become one of us, second, by being born into poverty and humility as the son of Mary and Joseph, third, by doing for us the job that was ours to do, but we could never do it, and that is to live a perfect human life, and fourth, by willingly going to the cross and paying the cost which we should have paid but couldn't, to set us free from sin, death, and condemnation forever. The great love of Jesus has propelled us into a new life where we have a close, intimate relationship with God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. In this new life from Jesus, we have complete forgiveness of all of our sin. We have free and open communication with the one who created us and all things. And the Spirit of God lives in our hearts to give us strength and courage and direction all the days of our lives in this world. And when our life in this world comes to an end, Jesus will take us by the hand and lead us to the resting place which he has prepared for us, where we will wait for the grand finale. For one day, Jesus will come back to this world in a visible way, and he will banish all evil, heal all creation, overturn every injustice, and raise us to life with new resurrection bodies that will never grow old, never get sick, and never, ever die. In Revelation 21, John describes the vision that Jesus gave to him of what life will be like when all things are fulfilled, and he said it in this way, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the old heaven and the old earth had disappeared, and the sea was also gone. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven like a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. I heard a loud shout from the throne saying, Look, God's home is now among his people. He will live with them and they will be his people. God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. And there will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All these things are gone forever. Dear friends, this is the fulfillment that we are headed towards because Jesus has shown us the full extent of his love and loved us right to the very end. This is what great love does. It selflessly loves people toward fulfillment. So how do we do this? How do we love greatly? Well, to find out, we turn to the second clue which John gives to us in verse 3. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper. Jesus knew that his Father had given him great power, Jesus knew that he had all things in his hands. He knew that he had come from God to pay the full cost of redeeming and restoring all things, and he knew that he was going back to God to wait for the day when he could come and complete 
that redemption and restoration. But Jesus also knew that he didn't need to use his power to preserve and protect himself. He knew that his Father would carry him through the deepest, darkest time any human being in all of human history would ever experience. And though the greatest, though evil would throw its very worst at him as he hung there on the cross, Jesus knew that in the end his Father would lift him out of the grave and invite him to rule over all creation. Jesus' greatest power was his faith in his Father because that freed him to use all of his personal powers to serve others. It was Jesus' great power combined with his great love that enabled him to humble himself and serve others in a way that lifted them up toward fulfillment and completion. With his great power, Jesus did not have to be concerned for himself or what other people thought of him. He was free to humble himself and serve others in their greatest needs. With his great love, Jesus was able to see that his followers' greatest need was to be shown how to humbly love and serve others. Because that's how they grow to become more like him. And that is why Jesus washed his followers' feet and then said, And since I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you ought to wash each other's feet. I've given you an example to follow. Do as I have done to you. I tell you the truth, slaves are not greater than their master, nor is the messenger more important than the one who sends the message. Now that you know these things, God will bless you for doing them. If you go online and search for Darren Ray, I am second, you will find the testimony of Darren Ray. Darren was born with a cleft palate and a cleft upper lip, and even though he had several surgeries to, con to correct that deformity, uh, he was still bullied by kids, and he was even rejected by adults because of the way he looked. In his loneliness, Darren became bitter. In his mind, his young mind, God was just like all of the bullies. One Wednesday night when he was at church with his mom, Darren asked her why God made him so ugly. She paused for a moment and didn't say anything. And then she said to him, uh, look at the windows of the church. It was dark, and so they, they weren't very appealing, those stained glass windows. But then she said, what do those same windows look like on a Sunday morning when we're worshiping here and the sunlight is streaming through them and all these brilliant colors are falling on our faces? Then she said, God has made you beautiful just like that. You are a piece of that window. Son, you just have to have eyes to see it. You've got to trust him. And Darren remembers thinking, even back at that young age, do I believe my mom? But even more so, do I believe God? Several years passed, and uh, Darren grew up and uh, got married, and him and his wife were living in California, and they had a three-year-old daughter, and life was good. But all of that changed on August the 20th, 2006, when an impaired driver crossed over a double center line and smashed head-on into Darren's car at 60 miles an hour. The accident left Darren's body badly broken and his right leg had to be amputated below the knee. Darren's spirit was also broken and he questioned God. People tried to come alongside him and remind him that God still had a good plan for him, but Darren couldn't see that good plan. 
All he could see was broken pieces and he wanted to lay down and die. There was a chaplain by the name of Jerry Roberts who kept coming around to try and encourage Darren. It just got to the point of being annoying, actually. And one day, in frustration over Darren's attitude of of defeatedness, Jerry burst out and said, Darren, do you think that God has called you to be a professional patient for the rest of your life? And that hit Darren between the eyes. And he began to realize that God was trying to bring him hope in the midst of his despair. And Darren began to want to live. And even more so, to live for God. Darren happened to learn that the driver who had hit him was in jail and couldn't afford to pay the $2.5 million in restitution that had been awarded to Darren. And so, when the matter went to court, Darren went before the judge and asked him that the amount that the man owed to Darren would be completely forgiven. And the judge asked him why he would do such a thing. And Darren said, because I have a Savior that forgave my debts that I could never repay. And the judge ordered that Darren's words be taken down and read to the man in jail by the warden. And when Darren learned how to forgive the man who had hit him, it melted his bitterness and it helped him to heal. And three years later, Darren went to seminary and he later became a pastor to senior adults and the disabled. And Darren can now see that through all of those challenging years in the past, God was teaching him how to come alongside other people and help them in their moments of pain that are the same as what he experienced. Growing up, All Darren could see in his life was broken pieces. But God took all of those broken pieces and put them back together into something completely different that made Darren whole again. Dear friends, the challenge that I want to leave you with today is this to turn your focus away from what you may have lost and shift it toward what you have been given. When Jesus Christ brought you into a new life with him, he not only forgave you all your sins and gave you the gift of eternal life with him, he also gave you access to his power and his love so you can humbly serve others in his name. And when you do, you will connect others to the Savior who can take all the broken pieces of their lives and put them together into a new life that is whole and beautiful and a blessing to others. You see, great power with great love helps us to humbly serve others. And humble service transforms lives for the kingdom of God. Dear friends, That is our God-given superpower. And it's how we selflessly love others towards fulfillment in Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, we thank you for your great and wonderful love for us. We pray, Lord, that you would help us to see that you too, just like you did with Darren, are bringing us hope in the midst of our despair. Help us to rest in your love and your great power. Help us to lay down all concerns we may have about our own lives because we know you're carrying us. You have freed us to humbly serve others in your name, with your love and your power. And we thank you.
In your precious and holy name we pray. Amen. Now, for those of you who are worshiping in person today, you found a bar of soap on your seat when you came in. And so I I invite you to take that bar of soap home with you as a reminder to humbly serve others in Jesus' name with his power and his love. Here at Walnut Grove Lutheran Church, our vision is to be a church where we help people of all ages to be passionate about, equipped for, and effective at transforming lives for the kingdom of God. If you would like to partner with us financially as we seek to carry out this great and wonderful vision and mission that God has given to us, you can do that by giving online, and you can donate online at WGLC. Dot org slash donate, or if you'd like to set up an ongoing giving relationship with us, and if, if you haven't done that uh, already, please email us at admin at wglc.org, and uh, we'd be happy to set up uh, arrangements with you to do that. <laughs> to stand if you are able for prayer. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we lift up to you our broken and hurting world, and we pray for peace. 
We pray for an end to war or violence wherever it exists. We pray for all those who, are, who have suffered or are grieving because of what happened in our country's residential school system. And we cry out for healing and reconciliation. We pray, Lord, for an end to hatred. And so we pray for all who are grieving for the four members of the Afzal family who were killed last Sunday. We pray for healing for the nine-year-old son who survived. We also pray for the driver of the pickup truck. We pray, Lord, for all those who have been driven from their homes because of violence or persecution or natural disaster. And today we especially lift up to you the Treek family and we give you thanks and praise and honor and glory for the good news that Treek has had his heart procedure and we pray that you would continue to have your healing hand on him as he recovers. We thank you, Lord, that Sarah has been released from detention. And we pray that Irene would also soon be released. We pray for your comfort, your courage, and your strength for the entire family, including Shazia and uh, Simon and Solomon. We thank you, Lord, that the case counts are going down and the number of vaccinations are going up and, and that our province is in the process of reopening. We thank you, Lord, that we can begin to return to in-person worship. And we pray, Lord, that in your mercy and your wisdom, in your timing, you would bring an end to this pandemic. But Lord, help us to never forget the lessons that you have taught us during this challenging time. And help us to continue to keep our eyes on you and to continue to trust in you. For you are a great and wonderful God. We thank you, Lord, for all those who are sharing the good news of Jesus Christ throughout the world. Today, we especially pray for Reverend David Summers, who serves as missionary at large for Lutheran Church Canada's French ministries in the province of Quebec. We pray, dear Lord, that you would bless Pastor Summers, that you would provide all that he needs to carry out the work that you are calling him to do. We pray that you'd work in and through him in a powerful way to draw the hearts of more and more people closer and closer to you. We pray, Lord, for those who are close to death and for those who are grieving the death of loved ones. We lift up to you Grant F., who is in hospice care. We pray for him and his family who are journeying with him during these last days of his life on this earth. We pray for Emmanuel P.K. and his family who are grieving the death of his mother. For William H. and his family who are grieving the death of William's father. And for all others who are grieving, we now name before you in our hearts in this moment of silence. Dear Jesus, we thank you for dying for us on the cross and rising again to give us the sure and certain promise of resurrection life. And we pray that you would wrap your arms of love around all who are grieving and comfort them with your presence and your promise of life eternal with you. We pray, dear Lord, for all those who are in need of your healing touch. For Paul H., we we lift up to you thanksgiving, Lord, that he was able to come out of uh, ICU to a less intensive level of hospital care. And we pray, Lord, that you would continue to give him your healing. We pray for Dario, who's in hospital, experiencing pain and will be undergoing a new 
uh, treatment for the cancer that he has. We pray for Felix, who's in critical condition with a head injury and now has COVID. Pray for Wendy Jay's 34-year-old daughter who's been diagnosed with advanced cervical cancer. Pray for Tanya, who's struggling with mental health. For Gail, who is waiting for a diagnosis for a mass on her liver. For Todd, who needs surgery for a tumor that's growing into his middle ear and throat. For who, Patty, who is healing from cancer surgery. For Bryant G's father, Lori, who may have prostate cancer. And for others who we know need your healing touch, Donna L., Alex, Divya, Shauna, Otto, Dolores M., Barbara, Tony, Monica D., Julianne L., Scott, Pastor Carl, Lynn, Damaris K., Corey, Sean, and Ruth H. And for others who we know need your healing, we now name before you in silent prayer. Dear Lord, you are the great physician and the source of all healing whenever it happens. And so we pray that you would strengthen our loved ones both in body and in spirit and help them to know that you are always with them, that you always love them, and that they are forever safe with you. Lord, we pray all of our spoken and silent prayers in Jesus' name. And we pray as he has taught us, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. As our time of worshiping God together comes to an end and you go out into the world to share God's love with a broken and hurting world, go with this blessing from God. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. I was buried beneath my shame Who could carry that kind of weight It was my turn Till I met you I was breathing but not Alive. All my failures I tried to hide It was my turn Till I met you You called my name
had the weight of your glory I needed shelter, I was an orphan Now you call me a citizen of heaven When I was broken, you were my healing Now your love is the air that I'm breathing I have a future, my eyes are open Cause when you call my name I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness To your glorious day You called my name I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness To your glorious day
Thank you.